Hello and welcome back to the Breaking Muscle Podcast, where we bring you the stories of some of the leading entrepreneurs in the fitness space. I'm Pete Hitzman, the managing editor at BreakingMuscle.com and your host for today's show. If there's one universal truth in the 21st century, it's that life doesn't slow down. For many, the time and inconvenience required to go to the gym have become a barrier to their fitness goals. This has sparked the rise of the home gym, as garages and basements across the country are repurposed from man caves to iron oases. But just because you've built your own personal barbell paradise doesn't mean you know what to do with it. Enter Jared Moon, founder of End of Three Fitness. After an injury spelled the end of his career as an Air Force pilot, he dove headfirst into becoming a fitness professional and never looked back. Jared creates programs to take the garage athlete to elite levels of fitness without the need for a lot of fancy equipment or excessive risk. Jared sat down with me to discuss how he made the transition from side hustle to full-time fitness entrepreneur, where he now helps athletes navigate the pitfalls of working out at home. He talks about how mindset is an integral part of the programs he constructs and the type of athlete that is most likely to find success in his system. We also touch on the problem of poverty and poor health in America, why programs don't have to be sexy to work, and I get his thoughts on the industry fight to standardize certifications. I want to give a big thanks to all of you who have signed on to the Breaking Muscle podcast so far this year. If you haven't already, please help us get the word out by subscribing, sharing the show with your friends, and leaving us a rating and review over on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play Music. And as always, if you have any thoughts about the show or suggestions for future episodes, drop us a line at editorial at breakingmuscle.com. Joining us this morning on the Breaking Muscle podcast is Jared Moon. He is the founder of End of Three Fitness, which specializes in taking off a whole layer of excuses and why you don't work out by giving you everything you need to know and everything you need to do within the confines of your own home. Jared, thank you so much for sitting down with us this morning. Yeah, man, I'm uh, pumped to be here. So why End of Three Fitness? I was looking all over this morning and I never really found why the name. Yeah, that's one of the biggest questions and I always forget to make that like a little bit more readily available on the website, but I was in the military and active duty when I actually started this uh, website, this adventure, and I didn't know what to call it. I knew, I, I mean, I'd been super passionate, even up to that point, almost over a decade, super passionate about fitness, and I didn't want to call it Moon Fitness or you know something that had to do with my name. Um, and back in high school, my friend was starting a band, and he was like asking all of us for. Uh, band names and I was like dude you know how the drummer like counts down like three three two one and then like then you start the music I was like you should be like the end of three band that would be cool he didn't like it at all and so he, <laughs> he didn't go with it but uh I had told my wife that story when we were in college and so I when I was asking her she actually recommended it from that idea a long time ago and I felt like it fit perfectly because a lot of the workouts, uh, you know, high intensity start with a countdown. If you're on a treadmill, it starts with a countdown. Everything's starting with a, a three, two, one. Uh, so that's kind of where our fitness is happening at the end of a countdown. Perfect, and it's it's uh, fitting that you would take a name from a from a garage band, being that you are sort of the quintessential garage athlete. So, what's uh, what's the end of three story? You mentioned you and I share a, a background in the Air Force. Obviously, yours was slightly different than mine. You were in you were in AFSOC. Uh, and I was just a, a normal guy, I guess. How did uh, how did you decide you were going to do this online coaching thing? Oh, so actually, I started in the Air Force as uh, a pilot. Okay. I was in, so I did the ROTC thing, uh, went in. Uh, so a long time ago, I, I kind of had two paths. I was either going to go into the Air Force and try and be a fighter pilot, because that had been my dream for a long time, or I was going to go into fitness somehow. And uh, whether that's personal trainer or whatever, I just wanted to be in the fitness industry. And so I went in, uh, ROTC did that because I knew I could always get into fitness later. So I was like, let's try this uh, fighter pilot thing. Uh, I got selected to be a fighter pilot. I was at uh, Shepard Air Force Base in training. Uh, it's called the Euronado Joint Jet Pilot Training, and I was doing that uh, for about two years, and then I got injured in that process. And I knew right then and there that so my – that active duty service commitment dropped from 12 years to four years because pilots have 12 year commitments, and I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna continue down this path. I knew as soon as I got eliminated, I got injured, uh, and so medically disqualified from flight. I knew I was going to 
pursue fitness some way, shape, or form. So pretty much the day after I re- received my final disqualification, I started uh, an online online uh, presence, should you say. It wasn't, uh, I wanted it to be a business, but I had no idea what I was doing and had a lot of lot to learn, but I was super passionate about the fitness side of things, started training clients in my garage, and then, yeah, I made my way to AFSOC and uh, got to be a physical training leader there and a unit fitness program manager uh, for a lot of operators and everyday airmen, and so it was that I got a lot of experience there under some great strength and conditioning coaches and just uh, took as much of that to my website as I could. Now, I've spent about a year of my life in lovely Wichita Falls as well uh, for aircraft maintenance training. And nice. I wish that I knew then what I know now, which is that that's where Mark Ripito lives. Yeah. So we're, did you did you ever get to, to train over there or no? No, I knew he was there, but I just had never uh, – I never took the time to go. Uh, but, yeah, I knew he was in Wichita Falls just because I had seen some information. And uh, I, I'm good friends with uh, Brett McKay from the Art of Manliness, and he lives in uh, Tulsa. And okay. he's traveled to Mark Ripto's joint a few times, and uh, I've I've just always missed out on it. But yeah, he's there. I wish I, I wish I would have had those years back. I was uh, not exactly into fitness at that time. Um, so how did you? <laughs> that had to be a gut punch. You were you were well into your training at that point, and it, you know you were saying it's a lifelong dream, and it, you know I had a lifelong dream of being a fighter pilot for a long time as well. And so when you figured out that wasn't going to happen, how quick was your turnover into? Okay, new life plan. You know, I get asked that question uh, quite frequently. They're like, you know, <laughs> it, it would be easy to, like, uh, you know, go down a bad path, maybe uh, embrace the bottle, you know, so to speak, or something, and, and get a little depressed about it. But, I I mean, maybe I gave it 24, 48 hours before I was like, all right, we're moving on to something new. I didn't know the plan. I just knew the direction. And so I just moved forward as fast as I possibly could. It honestly was, you know, a couple days when I was like, all right, that didn't work out, no need to dwell on it, because I knew it was, I had exhausted, it wasn't like, hey, you, you might not fly again, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to start going down this, it was like, appeal after appeal, and then I was just stuck, and they're like, yeah, dude, you're you're not going to be able to fly a high-performance aircraft, you know, you're probably going to get hurt again if you do that, and so I was like, all right, you know, I, I got, I'm getting a new plan, you guys got me covered for two years, uh, you have me for two years, so I'm going to start building this uh, business as a side project. Awesome. So when, where did the uh, invite to AFSOC come in? Oh, so that was just my next career field in uh, – I, I was doing public relations for special operations. Is, okay. uh pretty simple, which was really, really cool to be uh, with a lot of those uh, operators and stuff and do a lot of the, the cool stuff that they get to do. Uh, but, yeah, no, I was not one of the, the cool guys. Uh, they, they, they tried to get me to go that route multiple times, but – once the pilot thing was over, I was like, I'm really focused. I have a, a wife and two kids. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going down that path. I know what, exactly what it looks like. Uh, so I got to experience all the cool stuff without being one of the cool guys. Public affairs for special operations. That's a lot of, yeah, it's cool. I can't tell you about it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much, uh, it's, it's very different than a, a typical public relations job. You know, they, a lot of them are, are dealing with uh, Facebook and Twitter and, uh, you know, we're doing, just a lot of different stuff, you know, right. so it, it's a lot of fun. So you went from uh, training people in your garage, you were very into CrossFit for a time. Um, when did that transition happen? So I was in the bodybuilding space for a long time. I'd say seven, eight years. That's what I did, uh, just working on getting bigger, bigger, stronger, all of that stuff. And then I, I, uh, it was a friend's dad who actually, you know, came up to me and uh, we were, me and a buddy, we were working out. And he's like, hey, why don't you guys try, like, a, a real man's workout is what he called it. And I was like, dude, we're, like, squatting today. Like, what's what's a real, man work, real man's workout? That's what I'm doing today. And uh, he's like, no, give this a try. And it was, like, this really simple uh, CrossFit workout with, like, sumo death of high pulls and pull-ups or something like that. It was really short and intense and uh, absolutely kicked my butt. And uh, I was like, what am I training for? You know, I, I didn't understand as much as I do about strength and conditioning and energy systems and everything at, the, at that time. And I was like, I'm working out all the time. I'm getting bigger and stuff, but what am I really doing here? And that's when uh, I kind of started to transition towards functional fitness. And so, yeah, I got pretty heavily into CrossFit for a good amount of time, but then found some things I didn't really like about it and then just kind of started down the strength and conditioning path. 
Uh, but I still love CrossFit. There's a lot of great things about it. Uh, it just doesn't fit well with uh, my training and a lot of my athletes. So I want to touch on that for a second because the usual path for somebody with the narrative that we've talked about to now is that you know, you find CrossFit, CrossFit kicks your ass, you fall in love with getting your ass kicked, and then you go get your L1, you go open a box, you go work out a box, something like that. So why, what what stopped you from going down that path, I guess? Uh, so I, I got really close to that path. I mean, I got, got my level one only in really in preparation to hopefully open my gym. Like I said, I was, I didn't know what post-military my career was going to be. I just knew I wanted to be in fitness. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was thinking about opening a gym. Uh, but the actual training of CrossFit, is where I started to see a lot of problems is yeah it kicked my ass which is great uh, but the more I educated myself on training and proper progressions not only in conditioning but strength uh, I felt like I needed a lot more and a lot more structure to my training than CrossFit provided mm -hmm. and so since that wasn't there I, I, I think that CrossFit is great for for a lot of people you know a lot of people but this uh, doing a Metcon every single day, high intensity with no proper pacing, no strength work. And a lot of people, you know, you asked, we, we had this conversation, if we had this conversation a few years ago, five years ago, a lot of people weren't adding strength. Now it's like almost at every single CrossFit box out there. But even the proper conditioning, uh, like running your head into a wall over and over every single day is not how you actually get better or more conditioned. And so once I started learning these things, I was just like, ah, I'm going to have to, I, I, my training has to be different, so I, I went down the, the path I'm on now. Yeah, I definitely understand what you're talking about. I'm I'm somebody who I I'm kind of a uh, I like the fitness buffet. I like to try all the different things. Yeah. Um, and what I've discovered with with most CrossFit programming is that it's it's the gym that I go to now is a CrossFit gym, and I'm in their barbell club, right? So. I was doing their CrossFit program for some time, and it's it's very good. It's very well balanced. It's challenging. But I personally benefit from a much more directed, what I call a calm the hell down strength approach. Just go in and do, you know, very kind of regimented work on a program. It, it, I thrive a lot more in that environment than I do in the sort of chaotic environment of CrossFit. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Like being a, a multi-sport athlete, like I'm, if I was in the gym probably five, six days a week, obviously that programming would work better. But because I'm also running and cycling, I'm not going to be in the gym five or six days a week, especially during the summer. But a, a strength yeah, and, program is much easier to keep up. And, and not only strength, it's the, you know, why I fell in love with CrossFit was listening to a lot of, uh, reading and listening to a lot of Greg Glassman. You're talking about different energy pathways and all the data. So I'm a, I'm a data nerd and I love all of that stuff. And then once you, you dive into CrossFit programming, you ask someone, what what is good CrossFit programming? They're going to start talking about uh, balancing gymnastics, you know, with skill work, with strength, with Metcon. And those are just things that you do. You know, those are not actually, those are not training the energy pathways like Glassman was actually talking about. Mm -hmm. They're not really getting you stronger. And so once I, I realized, okay, the at the highest level of CrossFit programming, people are talking about making sure they have, you know, they hit muscle ups three times a week and then they hit uh, this kind of Metcon up three times a week. And I'm like, that's, you're not even hitting, you know, the real physiological training needs that you want to progress. So this isn't, this is not going deep enough, you know, so there, there is more, uh, there's more to, to peel back here. Yeah, for sure. And there are one of the, one of the, uh, guys who's written for us a lot, Dan Callen, is famous for saying there is no such thing as CrossFit programming. And in, yeah. <laughs> in a lot of respects, he's right, because there is no sort of canonical, this is what CrossFit programs look like. And that's okay. Like, it's still evolving. But there are, you know, a handful of people out there, Kenny Kane is a great example, who has taken programming and gone back to the science and said, look, this is how we're going to actually hit all the things we want to hit. This is how we're going to actually hit all of the energy pathways. We're going to develop that kind of holistic strength that you're looking for. And um, it's out there, but it's not as common as maybe it should be. And I wonder when it'll happen that, that the CrossFit methodology as a whole makes that next evolution to where everybody sort of reads from the same sheet of music as far as, um, you know, taking their programming to the next level. Because the, I mean, the people who are doing it right are out there, but I don't think that their message has really taken hold at a majority of gyms yet. I hope it has. I, I, yeah, I would say most gyms aren't, aren't doing it. I mean, you, you can't even look at CrossFit Games athletes. They're completely different, right. uh, training completely different sport. And to be honest, this whole get in the gym, 
15 to 20 minute Metcon and move on is is all a lot of people need for a while. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, as long as it's done under all of the right parameters of being safe and scaled and all of that good good stuff, that's all a lot of people need. And so I don't know if CrossFit itself would actually care too much to change their methodology, but yeah, the, the affiliate has a lot of uh, power there to you know segment their 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 athletes or uh, you know just put a little bit more thought into it so people see greater results. And that's always what I talk to when I talked about programming and, and to other coaches and people, especially box owners, you know, that's your biggest selling point is the results you get. You know, that's how you're going to keep members. That's how word of mouth is going to spread and, and all of that. So programming is, is paramount. So let's, let's kind of touch on that. You follow a programming philosophy that you've, you've called minimalist training. What does, what does minimalist training look like to you? Minimalist training, you know, we use that terminology sometimes. I th I'd say what we really do and what we're calling it now is block programming because it fits this big, much bigger picture of what we're doing. But minimalist training is really just just the things that you need. We're, just, we're staying away from machines and big contraptions. But to be honest, we're not so minimalist that it's uh, ridiculous. Like, I mean, I have a reverse hyper in my garage, and most people – yeah, a lot of people probably heard me say that just now. They don't even know what the hell a reverse hyper is. And uh, so I, I'm not opposed to a lot of the, the different things that you could use to improve your fitness and your strength. It's just specifically for my athletes, most of them, 95% of them train in their garages. Uh, they're they're kind of done with the whole P90X uh, thing or, you know, whatever video that they tried at home, but they also don't want to – Maybe they can't make it to a CrossFit box, or maybe they can't afford a CrossFit box. So they're kind of stuck in the middle. They want to be an athlete, but they're at home. Uh, so they're we call them garage gym athletes. And I can't you I can't utilize a, a tricep push down machine or calf raises, and uh, you know a lot of those things serve a purpose somewhere, but uh, not in our training. So we're typically sticking with things like kettlebells, barbells, plates, pull up bar, uh, plyometric box, and running. And then if you have it, rower, airdyne, things like that. So just just what you need for a really high level fitness. Well, and the advantage of sticking to those minimal equipment requirements is that you end up doing a lot more work in a lot shorter time. You know, if you go to your typical LA Fitness or whatever your big box fitness thing is, you're going to spend a fair amount of time accomplishing not a lot of work. And not just because you're waiting for, you know, Jimbo to stop curling in the squat rack, but because all of the things that are there are meant to do one very specific narrow thing versus a kettlebell, which anytime you pick up a kettlebell off the floor, you're using your whole body. Like, it, you can't help it because it's just a big freaking cannonball with a handle on it. So the that, that's kind of the advantage of, of training in a minimalist fashion. And you've, uh, with your programs, especially with your early programs, you were, you were really embracing that philosophy. So one man, one barbell, one man, one kettlebell. H how did you decide to focus that narrowly in, in – I want to talk about the challenge of creating a program that's that focused. So the first real program, yeah, I ever had was One Man, One Barbell. And that stemmed from, I was still kind of doing CrossFit-style stuff at that time, but there was no real strength program that would that would fit with it that greatly. Uh, you, people were doing Windler and then just tacking on a Metcon at the end, and I was like, right. this, uh, this is not, it works. And, and I'll tell anyone that it works, but... It doesn't work if you are trying to like continually get stronger for a year or more. And most most people have never been on strength cycles for that long. They've never gotten to like true elite levels of strength, and so they don't know that that won't work forever. It might work for your four week cycle or whatever you want to throw it in. And you might hit a PR, uh, but it wasn't working. And so I needed a program really that could just help me and my athletes get stronger and for us to be able to do other things. And so one man one barbell is is what I created and. Uh, through a lot of testing of, of different athletes at that time. And back to what I was saying, the athletes I had training didn't have access to a lot of equipment. So I wasn't going to try and bombard them with like, hey, yeah, you need to hit the reverse hyper three times per week, and uh, you're going to need some bands. you know, Because I, I, I would love to train with bands every single day, but most people uh, can't do that. And uh, So, yeah, we, we went as minimalist as possible. And it doesn't mean we can't still do accessory work because there's a ton of things you can do with a barbell. Uh, but, yeah, we – kind of put those those parameters on ourselves in the, in the creation of the program. And so what popped out was just a really solid strength program that takes very little equipment. 
how do you um, how do you attack the uh, the issue of getting too deep in a groove or getting bored when you're using a single implement? Like you literally wrote a program that requires only one kettlebell, and even for me, and I love kettlebells, but if I only had one of them at my house, man, I would have a hard time. <laughs> Uh, so I would say variation, like uh, the one manual kettlebell program specifically, you only use that one instrument, but uh, it, we, we operate in four-week cycles, and you don't really repeat a workout, and everything's different and progresses off of the previous week, uh, and we have a specific test in that one that you're trying to get better at, and so it's, it's really just a lot of structured variation um, in the programming, and then, but with uh, one manual barbell, that's not really the case. Uh, it's a straight linear progression. You're going to probably get really bored uh, really fast. If, if uh, you have fitness ADD, uh, I, I personally did cycle after cycle for eight months of pretty much the same thing to see how far I could take the strength program, uh, just personally. And yeah, it can get really boring, but what we have, uh, I publish updates to these things every single year. So One Man One Barbell has been some sort of new update, and uh, one of the updates was called uh, one man one barbell methodology and the methodology program has over a dozen different ways to like okay let's change it up bury this do this differently uh, to kind of keep it interesting but at the end of the day if the instrument is what bothers you yeah it's gonna be super boring because you're just using either a kettlebell or a barbell and some weight but it's not that bad I mean if you can get the variation with the movement you know for me working with kettlebells and I have a few because my overhead pressing is not quite as good as my everything else if you can get in a variation in the movements, it's, it's easy to stay engaged, I think, even for somebody who does like that fitness buffet like me. So I want to talk a little bit about the difference between in-person clients, your brick-and-mortar clients, and online clients. Like there's, a, there's a, I think, a difference in personality there. And have, what, what have you noticed? Yeah, there is a huge difference. And so you're talking about just specifically the client themselves, like the different types of person? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Okay, so I would say, I would say the person that I, I typically get online is going to be a little bit more dedicated than uh, someone who shows up because it, whether you're you're coaching at a gym or an affiliate or wherever you're at, you know they may have just stumbled in, you know, to find a trainer, didn't really know, maybe it's the beginning of the year, whatever the case is. Um, so I, I do feel like people I find online. Um, and, and part of it is kind of the perception we give off at Into 3 Fitness is this, you know, hard to kill um, mentality. A lot of them are very driven individuals. Everyone does struggle with motivation and stuff at some point. I'm not saying that they don't, but I would say a little more serious um, and a little bit more athletic background for people I train online. So I want to touch on that athletic background piece for a minute because one of the huge, huge, huge challenges in any type of online coaching scenario in any discipline is technique coaching, right? So when I go to my weightlifting gym and I, my coach watches me and then he videos me and he slows it down. He says, Hey, see, look here. You didn't actually extend all the, you know, I get those in-person cues to fix movement deficiencies. And that's obviously a huge challenge. You're not going to sit down over Skype and watch people, you know, watch 150 people work out all day, every day. Um, that would make you very unfit because you would be sitting on chair. <laughs> how do you, how do you hack that? So, First off, we don't program a lot of Olympic lifting. Okay. Uh, we, well, yeah. <laughs> just, uh, j just because uh, there, there are a lot of other ways to get the desired stimulus from Olympic lifting without having to do the Olympic lifts, and I think a lot of people are doing them just because it's you know it's a it's a cool thing to do. They are fun, uh, mm -hmm. and if you enjoy it, do it. Uh, so we stay away from that, but we go through a very detailed indoctrination process with our athletes, and uh, they have to go through these online fitness assessments. It takes, it used to take uh, two to three weeks, but that was that was really like, too long, so we, we shortened it to a week, uh, where you're taking these different fitness tests, and uh, you're watching a lot of videos on form, and then you can kind of, uh, based off the different scores and where you're at in these tests, you self-select where you want to go in our training. And so this took a long time to develop, but either if you're at this level, and like we have an actual mathematical score, okay, if you got a 700, you can start training with us here in the more advanced level. If not, you know, maybe start with this bodyweight program. So it kind of, if people just follow their paths, they end up where they should be based off of a lot of, uh, we've, we've taken as much as we could from in-person, like, hey, let's do an assessment and, you know, test this, test that, 
and put you here. Uh, we've done as much of that online as we possibly could, and like I said, it's taken a long time to do, uh, but we found that it keeps people safer, it keeps them seeing results for longer because they're properly progressing through our programs and our system, uh, and so that's that's one way that we kind of stay engaged even in the, in the online space. And I do actually, uh, it doesn't matter who signs up, uh, I, you'll, you'll get at least one Skype call with me at some point, and uh, I'll address three things with you on that call, and it's going to be, you know, injuries, mobility, form. That's like one category. The second is nutrition, and the third is going to be mindset. Awesome. So you, you like you say, you've taken the, uh, the onboarding process that you would have at a physical gym and translated that into an online product that helps people at least have a baseline understanding of what we're looking for right off the bat. Do you guys check back in? Do your coaches check back in with the athletes periodically and, and – see how they're doing? Because I know my, if I left my own devices, my squat will kind of migrate over time, you know, from, from a good practice to a bad practice, and I kind of have to reset every once in a while. Yeah, that's, uh, we do, we do check in with our athletes uh, pretty frequently, and we kind of have like a rolling system on how that works. But also, in every single workout that I write, uh, I do a video, not just a video on the form, they always have access to that. Every, like if it, if squat is programmed in the app and they click on squat and they can see squat form if they feel like they need to brush up on that. But having coached for such a long time, I do what I, is called an athlete brief video. And I just brief the full workout. It, but what I say in that workout is typically things I know are coming or people are starting to get lazy or they're going to try. Like if I say, hey, you got three attempts at a one rep max on the uh, back squat today, then I'm already going to be saying things like, under no circumstances, you know, should your form break down? Under no circumstances, should you not have a spotter during this time period? You know, all the things that I, I normally see when I was doing a lot of coaching in person uh, to try and preemptively stop them from making a poor decision. Those are the kind of things that I wish that we did a better job of teaching in sort of Fitness 101, right? Like, when, when you and I were in the Air Force, anytime we went to go do something, the first thing that happened was a safety brief. Right. right. Any, anything. If you went to go put up a step ladder, there was probably a safety brief before you went to do it. We don't really do a good job of that, I think, in the fitness space uh, in general, partially because it's not that exciting. It's not sexy at all to talk about, hey, if you need to bail out of a back squat, this is how you do it without crushing yourself. But yeah, we definitely, I think we need to have that conversation more often. Like, the, the concept of a technical one rep max, right? There, there is the eyeballs bulging, you know, legs quivering, knees caving in, all out, pray for Jesus, back squat, max effort. And then there's, you know, after you've been in the strength game for a while, you know when you're that close and you stop there because there's nothing to be gained unless you're going for a gold medal. There's nothing to be gained from, from putting yourself in that compromised position. But we don't really spend a lot of time talking about that. I think that that comes from my aviation and just military background in general is that we weren't going to do, especially flying, so you're, you're never going to you step to the aircraft without a very long and detailed brief about everything. Luckily, I keep those athlete briefs as short as possible, but right. yeah, it just made sense to me uh, when creating an online program that they needed that little extra push of coaching and not just the programming to, to make sure that they know what to do, how to attack the workout, more importantly, uh, intensity levels and things like that. Exactly. So there's an uncomfortable topic for a lot of personal trainers, which is that businesses like yours, because they've been enabled by ubiquitous high-speed internet and social media strategies and all that sort of thing, businesses like yours are substantially cutting into in-person coaching for well or ill. It, do you think that there's going to come a point where that the need for an in-person coach is almost removed? No. Uh, I think that uh, in-person coaching will always be very important. And it obviously depends on the, the population that you're talking about. But in America specifically, we're, uh, fitness coaches, uh, whoever you are in the industry, we haven't even made a dent yet. Uh, not even close to a dent in helping uh, this country be where we need to be. And so we're so far from in person, to be honest, anything, in person, online, we're so far from any of that needing a change. And to be honest, people who have absolutely no fitness background, uh, they've never done anything before, I mean, I wouldn't recommend they start with a program like mine. I, I would highly recommend them finding an in-person coach who can work with them one-on-one -on, -one on a lot of different things. And so, no, I don't think it's going to cut into it. Because also, if you're just looking at 
this I think the industry is getting way more entrepreneurial and everyone wanting to build their own brand and be their own boss and all of this stuff and that's great to a point uh, but at the same time if you're a coach and you just want to have some online clients uh, and you want to do 100 percent individualized personalized coaching and maybe you still meet with them in time you know a few times per week I mean how many clients do you really need to provide a living for yourself if you're you know a well-educated coach and you ha you charge good good rate I mean 20 30 clients uh, it's not a lot to support your lifestyle and to be honest that's not a ton of people so I think you know there, there's plenty to go around absolutely how many coaches do you have on your staff now two uh, okay. me yeah there's, there, I have a team of three and then we have a lot of other coaches who are those are like more full-time positions we have a lot of other coaches who are uh, certified in our method and our process and then they're kind of like contractors okay. and uh, we might hire them out for a 12-week cycle for mobility programming or a 12-week cycle to do this or do that um, but yeah the, the, the team at Into 3 Fitness the, the core team is three and then uh, a bunch of other contracted coaches. Okay, I, I wanted to ask that question because one of the sometimes problems with some online programming, I'm not making this accusation, mind you, but sometimes the person will take on way too many clients, right? And then you lose that individuality, you lose that personalization of programming, you lose the you you lose the coach's touch, as it were, um, that that keeps the program working for you. So how do you how do you sort of manage that load to make sure that nobody's handling or nobody's taking on more than they can handle to be honest I think I think that that problem that you're coming uh, you're talking about comes up when people are trying to produce some sort of secondary or third or fifth stream of income in which they don't really care about what they're doing and I won't point any fingers at anybody but you've seen a million different online programming pop up from famous athletes and everyone else in, in between who just wants to throw some workouts in an app and just call it good pay me your monthly service and get the hell out of here that a lot of that is going on and and that's fine um, if, if those people are advanced enough and can progress at their programs uh, but this is my full-time job I don't do anything else so I have plenty of time to you know manage this help my coaches, everything in between, because uh, just it's what I'm focused on 100% of the time. This isn't some secondary, you know, stream of income. It, it hasn't been a side gig in a long time. And to be honest, I didn't take on athletes at this level when it was a side gig. So I think it's just focus, man. I, I mean, I'm so focused on on helping my athletes. The only thing I think about uh, that it's it's pretty simple. I think if you're a productive person, to to fit it in all in your day. And to be clear, this is not a problem that only afflicts online coaching. There are a lot of CrossFit boxes that are run as side gigs. There are a lot of personal trainers who do personal training as a side gig. And speaking as someone who has several side hustles, <laughs> it, uh, it, you def it's difficult to focus your full care and attention and creativity and all those things on something that's not putting the roof over your head. Without without that imperative, it uh, or w when you have something else that's distracting you or soaking up hours in your day, it's it's really hard to turn out your best product for people. I think at that point, you know, to get more specific, because I was uh, side hustling for a long time, I I have no problem with that whatsoever. Right. Um, you just got to put a limit on yourself on your actual bandwidth because when I was taking 100% individualized coaching, you know, just online, but I was still in the military, I, I found that my bandwidth was really about 10. 10 athletes was all I could really schedule the calls with, do the programming for. And so that's just, that was my, my limit. That was my cap. And so you, you have to, I think you set rules for yourself, you know, what's actually possible and more is not always better because you're going to get to some level where, yeah, you might be making more money, but then it's going to start falling off the cliff because your experience, your athlete experience is going so far down the tank, you're just going to start losing athletes. And then it becomes this game of, okay, I need to get five more athletes because I'm going to lose four, you know, just this constantly running on the treadmill when it would be better just to focus on who you have and, and slowly grow it. Growing it within your, well, it's always a balance. I mean, as an entrepreneur, you want to grow fast enough to, you know, keep food in your belly, but not so fast that you, you know, outstrip your ability. I want to talk, I want to touch on something that not a lot of people and want to, an ugly truth in the fitness industry, if you will, as an entrepreneur, is that for a lot of people, turning your passion into a business 
is a huge risk to both the passion and the business. You know, you see a lot of gyms closed because the owners just burned out on it. You know, they had something that they loved very dearly. They turned it into a business. It would, you know, that fire rode for a long time and then it just kind of crashes off. Has that been something that, was there a day you woke up and you went, oh my God, this is work? <laughs> I'm sure I've gotten to that point a few times, but I haven't struggled with that a lot. And uh, for one very big reason in particular is uh, a mentor. I had, uh, not even in the fitness industry when I was coming up, uh, just in the on entrepreneur world about seven years ago, probably the only really real reason I am an entrepreneur is I was mentored by a uh, very wealthy real estate entrepreneur in Texas, and she had been an entrepreneur for you know three or four decades and she she knew what all the pitfalls what was coming and I mean, and she's super diversified she has like ten different businesses all making substantial amount, amounts of money and all these things and she just taught me a lot about how to be a good business owner, how to be a great entrepreneur and that's just uh, you know leveraging yourself to your strengths, hiring to your weaknesses and you know just being really smart about all of those things. So I would say it, it could happen very easily and you just have to really educate yourself on how how to run the best business possible while setting, like we were talking about with those athletes, you have to set limits on yourself. Every entrepreneur wants to make a million dollars, you know, after they start a business within two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that that's the goal and that's the hope, that's the dream. Uh, but if you are side hustling or if you, you see yourself getting burnt out, is it possible for you to pump the brakes and, and coast while you intentionally build things as opposed to running through a forest with our jungle, should I say, with a machete and just cutting your way through, which is most entrepreneurs' uh, way. And there's a great book, The One Thing by Gary Keller, and he has a very specific point in that book, uh, the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial approach to life and getting things done. And it's just this like, oh, yeah, let's do this. This is fun. Cool. Yeah. Oh, and then burnt out and then back up. And then, you know, it's just this really horrible roller coaster ride. I've been on it myself. And then there's the purposeful approach. And he calls it going from E to P. And that's where you're doing everything very intentionally and with a greater purpose and for good reason, having a big why. I think if you can focus on those things better, you will run into that much less. Yeah, I think that the, the methodical approach thing was something I stumbled on completely by accident. I didn't read a book or anything like that. It was just I was I was already doing methodical things and I didn't know where they were going at, at first. You know, getting into mm -hmm. the, the getting into the media space and then getting into fitness media, it was just kind of a confluence of circumstances where I suddenly realized I had been working toward this thing this whole time <laughs> and ended right. up there. But I got some really good advice from uh, a friend of mine who's an entrepreneur. When I was eyeballing my transition out of the military and I, I said I was going to go into business with another friend of mine and open a bike shop because I love bikes and I got this really cool property I was looking at. It was a perfect location and we're going to set up a little coffee shop on the side. It's going to be this great little boutique bicycling destination. And he said, Pete, you love bikes, right? And I was like, yeah. He said, Pete, you don't love people that much. Like if you're going to work in a retail brick and mortar position, you know, you're going to have to deal with a lot more peopling than maybe you want to do on an ongoing basis. And I was like, yeah, yeah you're right. Okay. <laughs> Looking back at it now, I think I, I would have been in that. I would have been macheteing. Everything's fun. This is a blast. And then I would have got to the point where I was dealing with the dude who, you know, told me I should have refunded him the price of his entire bicycle because he got a flat tire. And I would have just thrown up my hands and walked out. Now, I think working with people in any space, I, I always say that I'm a, probably an average coach, you know, and I'm talking about in, in person as far as correcting your squat and helping you with your day, you know, whatever you want to talk about, um, just because I'm a little bit more hard-nosed as a coach. And it's something I'm, I, I've am i been working on for a long time and I've gotten a lot better, uh, but I don't feel like I am a, an average programmer. I'm... Mm -hmm a lot better at programming uh, than I am anything else. And so that's why I have other people, like a girl named Ashley on my team, who absolutely loves talking to people and, you know, really thrives on that. And so she, and, you know, she kills it and crushes it in that area. And so, yeah, this it's just people who, everyone's different, right? And you can all, uh, you know, work to your strengths and weaknesses in whatever way you find appropriate. 
That's a really important point and one that, that uh, I think is overlooked in a lot of the criticism that is thrown at people who only coach online or people who have huge Instagram followings and you know maybe aren't the best coaches in the world or maybe who have huge almost celebrity level followings but you know they're they're what they're selling is terrible there is a, a, a marketing and a soft skills side to being a fitness professional in any discipline that if you don't have it, it doesn't matter how good your programming is, how good your in-person queuing is, it doesn't matter how cool the inside of your gym is, if you can't get people in, <laughs> if you can't attract the people to what you're trying to do, then none of it matters. You know, the message is never going to get out. And with with rare exceptions, you you have to be a little bit approachable and you have to be you have to attract people in some way. And it doesn't mean you have to attract all the people. You know, I'm not going to be putting pictures of myself in a Speedo on Instagram anytime soon just to get more likes. But the kind of people that I want to attract are going to be attracted by the message that I put out. And I think that's definitely the same for you. Yeah, and that's, I mean, just in business in general, you have to be a marketer. There's no, absolutely no way around that. And it kind of baffles me sometimes when I talk to other coaches and, and people trying to start things online and they, uh, kind of see marketing and advertising as this taboo thing that you really shouldn't do or talk about. It, and I don't even understand it. I, I, I never, I didn't, I guess I didn't hang out around enough coaches early on in my career when I was in the Air Force to, to learn that. Because, I mean, how, you, if you have the best thing in the world, you know, and you stand behind your product, why wouldn't you want to tell more people about it? And guess what? If you don't tell people about it, you're not going to have a business for very long. And so, right. yeah, there's just, you have to, it, you just, and then you going further into your point of the, the experience they have with you after they become a client or an athlete or whatever uh, is, is hugely important. If they feel like they're being treated like a, a number in a system. That's not going to work out either. So, Right. You, there's definitely one of the other things I've noticed is that there are places um, in the fitness industry where their marketing creates an expectation that is not met when you go through the door. Um, <laughs> right. And, and that, that's been something that I've struggled with, you know, as a sort of fitness media consultant when people come to me and say, hey, what do I need to do for my, I'm like, well, first of all, you need to clean up your business, you know, and so you're actually providing the thing that you're telling people you provide, and then let's tell people about it. But you got, I mean, you, you got to match, but you got to create the expectation, and then you got to, and then you got to live up to it, which is almost the harder part. How do you, how do you hack adherence? The biggest problem when I program for people remotely is getting them to do the darn thing, right? They paid me all the money, and they, I wrote them the program, and it's, you know, I put a lot of work into that, and then they'll do, like, a third of it, and then complain to me they don't get the results. So how do you how do you kind of keep people on track with that? That is a huge, huge issue in uh, online anything. And the main thing that we do, it, I spend a lot of my time on that. I, I'd say in my business, I have one, one coach who specifically – helps people with mobility, injury stuff. I have another one who's specifically more nutrition and some programming. And then I am 100% uh, programming and mindset. And mindset is the biggest thing that we have to tackle. And no one goes through our system without first going through our 21-day uh, mindset training. And this took me, <laughs> I don't know, probably a year and a half to create. It's not something I just threw together of like, hey, your first 21 days here. You know, we we dive into a lot of psychological principles on how to get motivation and success for the long term, how to stick to things, and it just baby steps people through the entire process. And we've gotten some amazing feedback on that alone. Uh, but then also what you're talking about, uh, people are fully – fully integrated into our system. I do have a, a, a podcast of my own. I put out athlete-specific episodes where I'm just like, you know, hey, get back on track. Like, that was one of the episodes we did, like, just a few weeks ago or months ago is get back on track, you know. So what if you, you quit or you stumbled? Guess what? You can start back right now. So we focus a lot on that. I do a lot of Facebook Lives in our own personal community and uh, emails. Like, that's I, I'm harping on mindset because the programming's there. And I know that they're going to see success as long as they stick to it. So the rest of my time is uh, making sure that they they are achieving that by sticking to things, doing whatever I can to help them do that, stick to it, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, the thing I've noticed of, of, about the conversation, the overall narrative in, in 
among fitness professionals in the last probably five years is that it's moved past sets and reps and, you know, arguing over whether front squats are better than back squats and all that sort of really boring stuff. And everybody has realized that to be a good coach, you have to dabble in sports psychology. You know, like you may oh, yeah. not have to go get an eight year degree for it, but I mean, you've got to, you've got to get between people's ears if you're going to improve their, improve their bodies, and improve their lives, because, you know, consistency is the best predictor of success in any endeavor. And that's especially true with fitness. Cause if you aren't doing it, man, you're not going to have it. Quick story. The very first online 12 week cycle that we did a few years ago, we had a hundred people sign up for it. And I was like, super pumped, you know, and like, I was like, hey, we're, we're going to get all these people results because this program has been tested, and, uh, but I, I kept finding that a lot of people weren't sticking to the program, and uh, that's kind of when I realized, and so everything we do it, in some way helps the person psychologically, like every single thing that we program is programmed in 10-minute blocks, or what, like, like I've mentioned a few times, block programming to help people stay focused and, and just focusing on what they need to do. That way they can take their brain out of as much of it as they need to. I just need them to show up and they commit in these small little micro goals. But yeah, if you're not focusing on that, like I, I, yeah, I got so tired of that stuff a long time ago. What you're talking about is like, yeah, should we, yeah, should our athletes be front squatting more or deadlifting less? You know, like who cares, dude? Like it, most programming is good. Actually, most of it is great as long as it's followed, you know, to a to to a T for you know let's say twelve weeks your athlete's going to see results as long as you put some thought into it and you have to focus the rest of your time making sure that they stick to it. Yeah, and for most people, there's a, a tendency to want to find the best program, right? Oh yeah. Try to find well, I want to maximize my strength gains for the next sixteen weeks, and so I'm going to spend nine of those sixteen weeks shopping around for the best squat program that's out there. When really at the at the point, and I include myself in this, at the point that most of us are performing physically relative to our overall, what I would call 100% capacity, any program is going to help. It may not be the best. You may get some marginally better gains with some other program, but you know, you've, you've mentioned Windler a couple of times. I did Windler for, I don't know, two or three years, and it was fine. I did fine. It kept me strong. I got stronger. Would I have done better with a different kind of program? And eventually I did. Sure, but it's not like I got weaker <laughs> doing right. Wendler. It's not like squatting every week is going to be bad for you. So yeah, don't overthink it. Just whatever it is that you're going to do, make sure the biggest, to me, the biggest indicator of a good program is that it keeps you psychologically wanting to come back right. and do it again. And so that's what you're talking about with your mindset piece. And I'd say the program, what you're, like the actual what you are doing in the program matters at depending on your level of uh, fitness or strength or whatever. Because if, if you did do Windler for two years, maybe that got you to a really high level, and maybe you're just like, you know what, I'm, I'm cool with that. Let's stay really well-rounded now or whatever. If you wanted to take that to a new level, yeah, you might need a powerlifting-specific coach who uh, can take you through you know, nonlinear periodization or, you know, uh, you know, linear periodization and nonlinear and then just, you know, all of these different bag of tricks that they have as powerlifting coaches, uh, working on accommodating resist resistance, all that stuff will matter, but that's good because you've already deadlifted, let's say three times your body weight and you're really looking to take it to the next level. And so what actually matters, it doesn't matter if you're just, like you said, I want to get my squat PR 20 pounds and I'm only at about squatting right now, you know, one time my body weight. Yeah. Okay. Just, just squat. That's the answer to that one. Uh, mm -hmm. So it just it kind of depends on where the athlete's at in their journey. Well, and that's where we come in as coaches, right? To kind of right. help people you know, sift through all that stuff. One of the things that is one of the marks, I think, of modern society is that everybody has become a specialist because there's seven and a half billion of us and we've created this incredibly complex society. None of us can really know all the things anymore. Most people don't know how to fix their cars because that's become a very specialized type of knowledge. Most people don't know how to cook food anymore, which I would argue that you should probably know how to do that, but really you don't have to because there are people who specialize in that. And if you've got the coin, by golly, they'll, they'll come to your house and do it for you. But for fitness, you know, th there's kind of an attitude where among, among people who are very fit, I won't even say among fitness professionals, but among, you know, high, high performing human beings that will why, why isn't everybody this fit? It's so easy. Well, you know, we don't teach people this stuff. It's not part of your core curriculum in high school or anything like that. You're never really taught energy systems and, you know, balancing intake to output and various methodologies of training. Like, nobody's taught how to care for their own health and fitness. So 
in a way, that's terrible because it's resulted in a very unhealthy society. But for us as business people, it's very good because we have that knowledge and we need to be better at, you know, not wasting time wondering why people aren't and get to the get the root of helping helping them out. So who's your toughest client? Who's who's the person who comes to you for help and you're like, oh boy. Typically someone who has a lot of uh, experience, too much experience. Hmm. And uh, that could be maybe they're a, they have been a strength and conditioning coach for a long time or maybe that you know something like that. And I'm, I'm going to say they've been doing that for a long time where they had been. It's just harder to, you know, maybe change some of their ideas about different things. And I'd say they're the toughest ones to get to adhere to a program because they're very intelligent. And if they don't understand something in your programming, um, they either have to have a conversation about it to understand it, which is fine. I love talking about programming. Or they just won't do it because they didn't understand it, didn't make sense to them. Um, and that's where, it's like the curse of knowledge, right? It's like the, the people who know too much tend to be the toughest ones to work with. And to be honest, they're not even that tough to work with. Just if you had to make me pick the toughest to work with, it'd probably be those individuals because there's a lot of I, I already know that or I know that mentality going on as opposed to having like a growth mindset and like let's just tackle this. Uh, and get better and see what we can do. Um, I'd say that's probably the biggest challenge that I've run into. Yeah, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, right? It, you don't you don't quite know enough yet to know that you don't know anything, <laughs> right? But, but you know just enough to be dangerous. I, I've I've said before in an article I wrote that uh, the most dangerous person in a CrossFit gym is the 18 month CrossFitter. Oh, they've yeah. they've been there long enough to kind of know their way around stuff, um, but not long enough to know that they really should just listen to their coach and back off when they're not, when they're ready for stuff. But now do you have a coach for yourself? I don't No, I, uh, I coach in program for myself. Okay. Uh, just, I've, I'm not, if I was going for something specific, I would probably hire out a coach. Um, maybe, <laughs> but, uh, to, to be honest, and, and it, it's a, uh, I mean, it could be looked at as an ego thing or whatever, but I've I've pretty much written every workout I've done since, I mean, for the last decade, you know, and so I, I just, I really enjoy that, and that's something I really like to do, and to see, that, that way I can never pin it on a program or programming, like, I, oh, that's why you didn't get stronger, it's 100%, did, did what you wrote, did what your plan, you know, did any of that work, and uh, I just really like doing all that stuff myself. And it's important, I think, you know, you, you test out personally all the things that you write, you know, so you know what it feels like, you know what's working, you know what to look out for in a lot of respects. I mean, obviously, people are going to experience workouts a little bit differently based on their own physiology, but you're going to have a much better feel for it than if you just wrote a program and shipped it out and said, you guys do this, have fun. Right. Yeah, I'm just trying to be really balanced uh, at a high level right now, and so I ha kind of have like these standards that I that I, I want to meet and it's the standards I of all of our athletes and those are the standards I want to maintain and hold and that's all I want and I know how to do that really well. Now if I was like, you know what, I want to get into a different sport. You you know, you mentioned cycling earlier. Like if I wanted to go be because I, I just moved out here to North Carolina, uh, and it's great to a lot of cycling around here. If I was like, okay, I want to be a cyclist now, specifically a road cyclist. I want to be competitive. I'm not you know, I'm not so arrogant to think that just because I know strength and conditioning really well, that I'm going to know exactly how to train on a bike. So in that case, if I wanted to completely shift gears, I absolutely would hire a coach, someone who knew more than I did and already been there, and let them program for me and teach me and all of that stuff. How much time do you spend studying other people's programming just to uh, see how they tick? I'd say a good amount of time. It depends. It depends. On, like if some, somebody would shoot me a link, they're like, hey, what do you think about this? And it could be one of our coaches, you know, like people who have been through our certification process and stuff. And... Uh, I, I will look at it just enough till I figure it out. Like I know what they're doing. And if I can't figure it out, I either think that they don't know what they're doing or they know something I don't. Those are the two assumptions. And so if I feel like they know something I don't, I'll, I'll dig in even deeper and deeper. Uh, but I, I mean, it's not super productive as running a business, right? But it's part of honing my craft. And so uh, I, I look at pretty much any, you could probably name almost any program online. I've probably taken at least a look at it to see what they're doing and why they're doing it. 
and uh, what principles it's following. And either I figure it out and I'm like, okay, that's cool, that's really smart, awesome. And then I just kind of move on or, like I said, I don't. And uh, that can be one of two things. Is there is there one that you've run across where it was kind of like, man, this is really cool and also I can't use it anywhere? Sometimes, like, so I'm a huge fan of Louis Simmons from Westside Barbell. And he just has so many great articles and ideas and methods. Um, but he, I mean, he coaches powerlifters, right? He, and uh, that's not that's not what I'm doing. So sometimes I'll run into some information that he has, and it's just absolutely amazing. And I'll be like, dang, I just can't apply it. And what <laughs> I, I mentioned earlier, like uh, training with, with bands, accommodating resistance, bands or chains, uh, you know, wrapping that around the barbell for dynamic efforts and stuff. I would absolutely love to program that stuff for my athletes. Uh, but then you need this like specific deadlift deadlift platform to hook the bands to, and uh, it gets really the bands themselves aren't cheap if you need a lot of them, and uh, we're looking at another thousand dollars if you really want to have a good band set up set up in your garage. And so, uh, yeah, I could probably skyrocket skyrocket some of my more advanced athletes with uh, just some simple additions like that, but I can't really apply it. I'd find workarounds or different ways to do it. So one of the things that is underlining your uh, methodology or philosophy is the idea that being fit shouldn't cost you everything. You know, you shouldn't spend the mortgage on trying to. You shouldn't have to spend the mortgage on trying to get into better shape. One of the really big problems in America is that there's a direct link between affluence and health. You know, our our lowest twenty percent, our lowest quintile of income, are you know, carry the preponderance of disease and obesity and, you know, early mortality and all that sort of thing. What needs to change in America to to remove that divide of the have-nots also being unhealthy? It's going to have to, unfortunately, the answer is it's going to have to come from the government in some way. And I'm not pro, like, big government, you know, trying to force people to do things, but, I mean, I think it was not that long ago Trump... I forgot exactly what he said. But he basically said he wasn't that into fitness or whatever. He's like, I'm however old, and I, I I never really worked out. You know, statements like that aren't helping America. And so it's going to have to take some sort of education from the top down because I I think everyone is doing a great job in the fitness in industry. Some people have really great reach. But like I said, we're not making a dent because most of the time the information we're putting out is for people who are, are looking for it or wanting to hear it. It, it almost needs to be force fed in some way, and I think that there are a lot of great like documentaries that people can stumble upon on Netflix stuff like that. Mm. Uh, but to hit those lower levels, it's going to take some baseline education that they're kind of forced to get somewhere. And enabling is, too, yeah. I I think we we do uh, a bad job at preaching to the choir, or a good job of preaching to the choir, but a bad job of of reaching the congregation, as it were. Um, even even at breaking muscle, it's a it's a it's an uphill battle. And um, I mean, you got to think about it from a business perspective too, because I'm not going to go uh, spend each and every single hour of my day in an altruist, altruistic manner, knocking on the doors of those who are not interested in my programming to try and help save them. Right? I'm trying to be a leader, not a savior. And so I'm going to lead the people that want to be led, and then hopefully that that you know can kind of ripple out. Uh, because if you do spend all of your time on the people who don't want to hear what you have to say, you might not be in business for very long. So it's it, it, it's a it's a definite line that has to be towed very carefully. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a low percentage game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trying to trying to shoot outside the circle. What uh, what kind of nutritional support do you guys provide? We've talked a lot about you've mindset, you've got your programming, um, and obviously the nutrition part is huge. So how do you how do you guys hack that? Yeah, so that's one of our higher tiers and what we do, like I, I mentioned, we have a coach specifically that she does nutrition uh, coaching and she, what we typically do, we it's very, it's kind of individualized and so there's not like a one size fits all on what we do for nutrition, but for the most part, it's cleaning up the diet and just getting people to eat the right things first, depending on where they're at, building good habits, a lot of psychological triggers based on that, helping people make better decisions like with just a lot of different techniques and, and approaches, and maybe I could dive into some a little bit, but first I'll finish the uh, the kind of progression. And then after that, if, you, if you're cleaning things up, we move to really simple approaches to, okay, you learned the clean eating nutrition principles, then we challenge them to 
like 80 20 90 20 or 90 10 percentages of like okay this week if you're eating three meals a day seven uh, per week or seven days a week uh, eighty percent of those need to be healthy twenty percent do whatever the hell you want uh, and then we slowly increase that to ninety ten and then after they get to that ninety ten and they get one hundred percent adherence to that uh, then we might move to something like you know a eight week to twelve week macronutrient plan like counting macros it's not something that we do for a long period of time but if they have like an aesthetic goal that they want to meet they're like okay I want to specifically do this then uh, We'll, we'll put them on a macro-based plan, but from from a lot of people, like we had one guy, uh, his name is Kyle. I've been working with him for a while. We, we're not even to the macros point yet, and he wanted to get to 100, 185 pounds body fat, which he was about 50 pounds uh, above, and he he got he lost 50 pounds and gained like hundreds of pounds in his PRs just by following these 80-20 rules and 90-10 rules with clean eating principles. So we keep it really simple until it doesn't need to be anymore, and then we. Uh, we demand a little bit more of your discipline and willpower to help you achieve like a higher level goal of a very specific thing. Yeah, I think that that progressive approach to nutrition is one that is so underutilized. There's I, one of the one of the articles that I read a while back that that did very well was changing your life is not a 45 day challenge. Right. And there's such an emphasis on, you know, try this six week diet. Try this. They, you're pushed to jump off the deep end when it comes to nutrition, which can work in the short term. But if you haven't changed the underlying psychology, if you haven't actually learned any principles, then you're not, you're not going to stick to it and you're going to lose all the progress that you made. And it's really unfortunate because every time you fall off of that, every time you gain those 10 or 15 pounds back, it's another brick in the wall, right? It's another, it, it becomes harder to commit yourself to something else again. Whereas if you took the progressive approach that you're talking about, if you started off, hey, look, <laughs> how about we're just going to lose soda? Just just do that. Right. Sometimes and do that that's for like all it Six is. weeks, do that for a month, do it for whatever, however long it takes until that becomes automatic, and then pick another thing and add it on. No, that, that that's 100%. That's exactly like... Sometimes we'll we'll be with someone and that's uh, it might just be hey you're drinking soda still okay that's where we're at you need to not do that mm -hmm. and like let's let's talk again next week okay right. and then you know that's that's kind of how that that approach will go um, and I do think uh, like counting your macros is great but that shotgun approach of like okay sign up here's your macro plan good luck you know that's uh, that's not going to work for most people and. I think that there needs to be a lot more focus on where the person's at and then helping them stair step into something like counting macros. So you mentioned you mentioned you have a coaching cert uh, that's coming out. What uh, What is that program like? Or that is out, I should say. It is out. So we launched it uh, earlier this year uh, actually due to demand from a lot of our athletes. It was never a, a big part of the plan. But what I do unintentionally through programming, I mentioned those athlete briefs and, and what we do in nutrition is we talk about the why of almost everything. And the reason I do it is to help athletes get more buy-in. So if I'm like, hey, we're doing these dynamic efforts today and it's for this reason, they, they understand more. And so even if they're not with us anymore, they have a bigger why. They're kind of putting tools in their toolbox on how training works, how nutrition works. That way, it's not like what you're saying, this 30-day challenge in which they just followed a set of rules and they maybe saw results, maybe they didn't. Uh, so me talking about the why all the time in my programming got coaches really interested and specifically the stuff on what we call the human element and you and I, you and I have talked about it a little bit mm -hmm. and so it's a six week course the first three weeks are pretty much focusing on our methodology and the human element about how what you mentioned is you could write the perfect program but if a person won't stick to it it doesn't matter whatsoever and so the first three weeks is all about that and the last three weeks is 100% about programming, how to write uh, programming for a year all the way down to a single training session to a single strength set and the why behind every single bit of that. Um, and what we're really trying to build is amazing uh, programmers who can also crush it in the mindset category because we, I felt like that was the, the biggest piss, <laughs> piece missing um, in all of this uh, in the fitness industry. Not a lot of people are talking about programming and how to do it. And I understand why. And uh, we've had a lot of coaches and trainers sign up who are like, dude, like I'm 100% good on like talking to the client, on, you know, making sure they're motivated and stuff. But I, you sit me down to write a 
12 week program that makes sense for them and I'm kind of lost you know without having to okay I'm gonna take this bit of program from someone someone else and this bit of program from someone else and you know mishmash it together and ta-da here's your program so we, we teach people uh, really in-depth programming and it, it's gone it's gone really well there's an assessment at the end of course people have to take and and also uh, write a lot of programming that has to get approved and by me specifically and uh, it's been a lot of fun man the feedback's been amazing do you ever take your students homework and uh, and use it in real life uh, no I've, I've I've thought about it before uh, but what I have them do most of the time now uh, I used to like go into like my files and pull an athlete that I had actually like programmed for for maybe like an eight week twelve week time period and give them all of their stats give them this athlete as their athlete and see how close they got it doesn't have to match mine just like see how close we got uh, and what we're trying to help this person achieve because I know I got that person results uh, but I, I've, I've changed it over the, the last couple months to them having to program for someone they know either themselves or an athlete that they're working with that way it's actually usable and, and we can just talk about it in, in detail so a lot of these programs that they write are used uh, it's just I provide a lot of feedback before it's used well I think there's there's something very important that you're doing there, having someone program for a specific person with specific needs. Programming is, and this may be confirmation bias speaking because I was a writer before I was a coach, but I think programming is a hugely creative endeavor. You know, you're, you're starting with a blank sheet of paper and putting something on it that's going to convey meaning and create a new person, really, in a lot of ways. So one of the things I tell our writers at Breaking Muscle is that if they're going to write their best content, if they're going to write the most compelling piece that they can, they should write it to a specific person. So there's a whole bunch of different ways to get that done, but you can you know, pick a person, pick a friend of yours, and imagine them in your head while you're writing. We've had uh, you know, experiments where we tell people to just go to the mall and sit down and watch people and then pick one that you're going to write you know, an article to. You know, the best songs are written to girlfriends, right? So it's, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where if you're writing programming and you find it challenging, it may be because you're trying to write something that's too general. You're trying to write you know, the best ephemeral squat program instead of trying to write the best squat program for a 42-year-old triathlete who's never done a, a dedicated strength program before, who is in sprint tries but wants to make it all the way to an Ironman. Well, now we've got a whole different set of parameters, and you're going to know that you know there's some corrective work that's going to need to be done because they're triathlete. They're going to have a lot of chances are going to have a lot of mobility issues to deal with. Yeah, so if you're having trouble writing programs, first – Call Jared and and find out you know what he can do for you. And second, use that specificity to drive the intent, which will drive the requirements of the program itself. I think that helps a ton. Writing it for specific population. The biggest problem I normally see, even after people have a lot of uh, knowledge and education on the topic, is they try to make their program too sexy. Is mm. they're like every single conditioning workout is going to be different because I'm going to show you how smart I am and how many different ways we could train that energy pathway and the strength is going to be the most you know complex thing but you're going to be so amazed it's uh, really unnecessary a lot of fitness and fitness progressions are boring and that's mm. how you make someone better unfortunately most of the time and uh, so I think getting away from that sexy program mentality and just writing stuff that works is is what's most important. Right. And there's ways to, I call it disguise boredom, you know, if... Oh, yeah. That's part of the psychology part of everything we're talking about. It can't be too boring right. <laughs> or, or people won't stick to it. Right. I want to ask you about, so now you have a product that is a coaching certification that you are putting out into the, into the greater space, and there are a million of them, especially yeah. in America, because we are sort of oddly deregulated compared to the rest of the world when it comes to who can call themselves a personal trainer, who can call themselves a coach. It, you don't really have to have anything. You can have no certifications at all and walk into, walk into your local 24-hour fitness place and start training people just on the basis of an interview with a manager who's probably making 10 bucks an hour and you know who can't yet grow a beard. So what do you think, is there something that needs to happen to kind of standardize that requirement in the United States or or should we just kind of let the market continue and, and hopefully the weak ones die off? Well, that's that, that would be my first point is the market will decide whether or not you're worth it because 
the people going through a certification are typically going to be other coaches or people super interested. I'd say, you know, fairly educated in the process, right? Mm -hmm. And so if uh, what you're putting out is trash from a certification standpoint, you're not going to survive very long. I mean, I, to be honest, I think you make it a year or two max unless you're just, you know, killing it on the marketing side of things, but you're not delivering on the back end. So I think the market will decide. But I also think that, unfortunately, the way coaching education is set up is that uh, this is how it is right now, and I don't know how long it will have to be, is that experience is always going to trump uh, any sort of formal education um, and even if that's just your own personal experience, uh, I don't think that you should rely on that forever. But I mean, if you've been training in a gym for 10 years, no, you're not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. You should not start a certification. That's not what I'm saying at all. But you're going to know more than someone who's you know not into that stuff. So you might be able to help another person. And it's just because you are very experienced in the process of fitness. Uh, but there should probably be some sort of regulation on certifications at some point, uh, but that's just where it gets scary of like who makes that decision um, and why do they get to decide because uh, it's not going to, the government is going to choose an organization, they're not going to form one if that's what happened in America and then you're going to have to adhere to whatever this organization believes it is. Let's mm -hmm. say it's the NSCA and maybe I disagree with the NSCA and they know it and it's in my certification stuff and this is not actually true I'm just saying like what if what if this were to be true uh, then they probably would never approve my certification right and so now I'm screwed I can't I can't do anything with them uh, in the future so it's a very very gray area I think it it needs some regulation but too much um, would be a bad thing and then also if you have a bad cert I'm, I'm not too worried about that out there because I do not think it would survive very long if you have if you've been training for five years and you put together your own certification, congratulations. You're going to have two coaches who've been training for 15 years who don't care about the money. They're just going to sign up for your thing and be like, that was absolute shit, and I'm going to let you know why. Uh, and so I, I don't think you'd survive very long. Well, the hypothetical that you described is, you know, if you had a beef with the NSCA, is kind of already rumbling. The NSCA and, and uh, oh, I forget the other, the other bodies that are trying to create a national coaching certification standard requirement. Um, and of course, they're doing that to protect their business interests, and so CrossFit is fighting back because they are accredited by a different agency, and so now there's this little sidebar right. fight going on in the courts. But it's an interesting thing to watch, and I've, I've written a column on it before because I don't think that we do want the certifying bodies themselves or the, the course offerers themselves deciding what makes a good course or not because the business interest is to try to put everybody else out of business, right? There mm -hmm. has to be some kind of objective, you know, everybody needs to come to the table and deciding what those standards need to be rather than, rather than a few uh, more powerful bodies deciding it for everyone else because the, the, the risks are not just that you're going to put you know, somebody out of business who's probably offering a decent product, but the risk is then that your product cannot evolve to meet, you know, changing requirements or new information, new knowledge. It doesn't evolve as quickly. One of the things that I, I work with um, some developing technologies with the Air Force, and one of the things that happens is that it reaches a certain point, and then you have to start, you know, adhering to big Air Force rules. Like you can kind of develop in your own little silo and not be interfered with until it reaches a certain time period or budgetary requirement or you need to start integrating with other technologies. And then you have to start playing by the rules. Well, that's where innovation stops because once you, oh, yeah. once you slap that bureaucratic requirement on top, um, it's just so much harder and it takes so much longer to get any kind of change enacted. So, yeah, I'm with you. I'm a little bit on the fence about, you know, whether we need to have... It would slow us down significantly to have to do that. It would really, yeah, it would be a huge, huge issue to try and adhere to everyone's standard every time there's a new thing out. It would also, uh, I always tell this to, to coaches and, and athletes, is that the this whole fitness industry thing is new. Mm -hmm. Like, people might not think that, but if we're, we're talking about in history, I don't, I don't even think that humans know that much about fitness. Like, I think that there's a lot more to learn, and so we should keep things as open as possible. I mean, a lot of a lot of the knowledge that was built up back in the day, you know, was based on not athletes. It, it was, you know, bodybuilders and, and things of that nature. That's where a lot of the literature came from. 
And I just think that there's so much more to learn that if we were to regulate it, because I've been in the Air Force as well, I know what happens when a large organization wants to tie something up in red tape, uh, it would be really bad. But there should be, I think there should just be like a, a like a baseline, maybe. Like, see, I, I don't really care about my cert beyond any other body because what we typically do is uh, we're certifying within our own ecosystem. Like, hey, let's you're going to program for athletes here. Uh, I already know their background as a coach and what they've done and stuff, so I make the decision yes or no. Uh, but I'm not trying to compete with the NSCA, you know, as a governing body. Uh, that's not not my my intent at all. And so I think it just depends on what you, what the point of your certification is. Hmm. What kind of continuing education do you pursue? Uh, you know, it's really to be honest, it's slowed down quite a bit. I, I always try to do. Uh, and I'm talking about from a formal standpoint, I don't do anything like uh, academically. All I do is pursue athlete seminars uh, and things going around in, in the local space. You know, I lived in Texas, so there's always something going down in Austin and Dallas area. Uh, but to be honest, I'm starting to stay away from a lot of the bigger organization conferences because I'm not getting a ton of value out of them. So my continuing education these days is a lot of conversations with other coaches, uh, just what's working for them. Because I, I was just talking to uh, Dan John the other day, and there just comes a point where reading studies and you know a textbook specifically, that stuff is not really helpful anymore. Uh, the, the things are moving too fast, so you it's bad and it's good. You almost only need to rely on your own experience and uh, what's going on in your environment. And, and making the best calls that you can there. Uh, I'm always studying on a daily basis, like like we talked about programming, things like that. But you, you know, you really have to ask yourself, what value am I getting out of this still, and uh, see if it's worth pursuing. Absolutely, and it's it's important to know that uh, continuing education is going to change the longer you're in any industry, but especially in the fitness industry, obviously if you went and got, you know, a master's degree in physiology or something like that, you're not going to continue to go get a new master's degree in physiology every four to six years. And likewise, if you, you know, if you've been in the kettlebell field, let's say, let's say you're an RKC trainer, you're going to continue to study that discipline, but it's not as if you need to like go to every kettlebell seminar you can find because they're all going to be talking about the same things. At a certain point, like, right. you, you've got that information. Yeah, because, I mean, for the last several years, I've been spending thousands and thousands of dollars per year on, I mean, last time I totaled it up, it was more than I paid for college in just different <sighs> uh, education programs, seminars, two-day events, three-day events, all of these different things. But now, as I kind of focus more towards, like, okay, I need to be the, the leader of this business and help develop the coaches under me. Uh, my focus has changed a little bit on splitting my time on where I'm educating myself on, like, do I really need to, how much more effort and money do I need to put into learning more about programming and coaching? And the answer is always going to be some, absolutely always some, you should be honing your craft, uh, but when you need to be a leader as well, you need to start being focusing on that just as much, like how to be the best leader possible in your business. Mm -hmm. Is that the area that well? Well, I should I should phrase that better. Uh, what is the area in your coaching or in your business that you're focusing on right now? Business specifically, mm -hmm. uh, you know, right now it's it's growth and managing growth and managing people in that dynamic environment because uh, my business is growing and it's intentionally. Uh, we I mean we do a lot of things to to make the business grow, uh, but a lot of the problems that you talked about with What's the athlete experience like? How do we make sure that we don't lose ourselves in the process of growth? And how, you know, most importantly, do I make sure that the coach is working for me and the future coaches that we're going to hire next year, like how are they developing to where, because I've seen a lot of other online stuff go down to where they work for an online company uh, for a year or two. They think that they can do the same thing, so they, they uh, jump ship and they're going to go start their online company. So making sure that you're developing them to the best of your ability with, you know, paying for their growth and education and development and making sure that they're learning things that they need to be learning and that you are supporting them to the best of your ability. Uh, I think that is where a lot of my, you know, I was an officer in the Air Force 
and I've always taken leadership very seriously and studied that discipline and, and utilized it while in the Air Force. And uh, it's just something I'm trying to hone constantly is how to be the best leader to my athletes and uh, people who work for me. That's hugely important if you're going to be successful in, in any enterprise. And it's something that's, I think, overlooked in a lot of smaller fitness businesses. So that's it says something about what you're trying to do, that you're focusing on the leadership. What is the future? You're talking about managing growth. What's the future for End of Three Fitness? So we used to put out new stuff all the time. And then that was kind of the, the I don't know, it was exhausting. It was, it was kind of the, the business model, should I say. And uh, we're, we're, we're slowing down. We're going to stop putting out new stuff and really just like 2018 we're really going to focus on some of the things that I've been talking about is making sure the athletes are having the best experience um, getting to a point like scaling is great uh, but like I talked about kind of towards the beginning of the podcast I want to continue to scale but at a manageable level you know to where uh, we don't lose anything in the process that we've built up and so really just uh, focusing on on slow and steady growth in 2018 and we will be putting a lot, a lot more information to, you know, certify coaches and, and make them more intelligent in programming, uh, which is going to be a big push in 2018. But also I want to put together, you know, the only new course development we have is making people as autonomous as possible in their garage by teaching them, making them a jack of all trades in fitness from, you know, teaming up with some physical therapists that I know to my programming information to, nutrition information and putting it all together in one one space for people working out at home who you make them uh, j give them just enough information to be dangerous almost at that 18 month crossfitter standpoint you're talking about but mm -hmm. put in the disclaimers there that you don't know anything yet you're you've just begun but what you're the, the overall concept you're talking about there is something that I think is a useful litmus test for anyone who's looking for a coach. If they aren't trying to educate you, if, if they aren't in effect trying to put themselves out of business, then they're not doing you a very good service as a coach. They should be teaching you the whys, the purposes, the principles behind everything that you're doing rather than just prescribing the sets and reps because, I mean, if they aren't, what the hell are you paying them for? You know, a coach is there, a coach is a teacher in a lot of respects, and if they're not doing it, then look somewhere else. Well, that's what I've, I've had a lot of our uh, more dedicated athletes sign up for our certification process just because they want to learn. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you, like, why would you teach all this? Because after you teach it, like, I don't need to subscribe to your service or yeah, I could just do all this stuff on my own. I'm like, absolutely, you could. That's fine with me. But at the same time, like, it's only going to take you maybe two or three months of programming to find out that it's a lot of work to, to program every single set and rep. And you might just not want the inconvenience factor of that, so you might come back. You know, I'm not even – I'm not concerned about it for multiple reasons. I want them to know. I don't want to hoard any information I've, I've gained over the years. But also, having someone else do something for you, I don't care how experienced you are, is worth a lot. So – yeah, and like we talked about before, it's not as if we're going to run out of people in America who need help with their fitness. It, right. It's not really a concern um, with, with the things that we struggle with in this country. One last question, then we'll start wrapping it up. I know I've kept you for, for uh, longer than advertised. Do programs in your mind rise to the level of intellectual property? In other words, if you write someone a program and they give it to somebody else, is, is, that, a, is that a foul? Uh no, I mean, I don't, I don't see any issue with, I mean, it depends, like if you're, no, I mean, I would say no, I, I don't think that it really matters if someone gives it away, I mean, if you're charging for something and someone's giving your product to someone else, then I mean, that's very clear cut, but if you're just talking about an Excel spreadsheet that's being shared around, I mean, why not help more people, you know, I don't, I don't think it's, like, like we just talked about, you have, in, in this world, you it's like online world, business world, you have to have an abundance mindset. Hmm. And uh, so I would go with, ah, it's fine. It'll all work itself out in the end. Yeah, I totally agree. It's it's something I've run up against in differences of opinion with, with some coaches. But my position is, dude, knowledge is free. The, the things that I have been given in terms of knowledge, I'm perfectly happy to give away. Now, coaching is not free because that takes my time. <laughs> so yeah. I have to make sure that I can still eat and do all those things. But all I mean, all of the... I'll, you know, I'll, I'll write you a program for free. I'm not going to help you execute it for free, but I'll, I'll write it down because it doesn't take much for me f running specifically. Like I can write a running program for most people for most purposes in not a lot of time. But to help you get through that program with, you know, negotiating the 
the perils and pitfalls of real life, that's where you know that's where the cost comes into both of us. So this has been a lot of fun, man. It's been it's been cool getting to know you over the show and uh, very educational for me as well as as far as the the ins and outs of running a purely online. Uh, coaching business. So where do people find you online and how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, so we have a lot of different things going on, two podcasts, uh, programming programs. If you want to check out any of it, just go to endof3fitness.com. That's all spelled out and you'll probably learn about anything and everything that we're doing. If you're listening to this podcast right now and you just want to type in a quick podcast, you can type in Better Humanology or Garage Gym Athlete. Uh, and you can check out those podcasts to learn more about what we're doing. Is there a social feed that uh, you prefer people find you? Uh, Instagram on Twitter and Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'm EO3Fit. Uh, our business one is Garage Gym Athlete, and uh, Facebook yeah, is Into 3 Fitness. Awesome. Jared, thank you again so much for your time. Um, I wish you all the best with your 2018 plans, and uh, we'll have to catch up again in the new year. Thanks, man. It's been a blast. Absolutely.